Okay, welcome everybody to the last of the talks before the panel discussion in the symposium. And it's a, it's a real pleasure again to um, uh, introduce uh, Garrett Medell, who's a professor of electrical computer and energy engineering at the University of Colorado. His research group uh, pursues new energy conversion technologies and other sciences, um, other science at the edge of our understanding. Prior to his academic position, he worked in Silicon Valley, solar cell startups where he um, sought entre entrepreneurial um, money and has caught the entrepreneurial bug um, that he says continues to plague him. Uh, Garrett earned his bachelor's in EE from Stanford, MS and PhD in applied physics from, from Harvard. Among all the people I've known over the years, uh, Garrett has one of the most active minds and most ambitious and fascinating research programs. And this, uh, his talk, I'm sure will evidence this. Um, but I would like to uh, finish the introduction with just continuing his uh, motif of Moby Dick. Um, Ishmael, as you know, is um, the first person narrator in, in Moby Dick. And, and uh, Garrett is the first person narrator, I think, of this, of this particular symposium, and also the protagonist. Um, unlike uh, Captain Ahab, uh, Ishmael kept an open mind with respect to Moby Dick. And yeah, as you will find in this talk, Garrett will keep an open mind with respect to the second law. His mind is always in motion. And um, as uh, Melville said about Ishmael, a flux and turn is the chief characteristic of Ishmael himself. So we shall call you Ishmael. Garrett, best for last. Continue. Thank you, Thank you Captain. Uh, uh, are we, I just want to check, are we recording? I can't tell. Uh, yes, we are. Okay, good. All right, thanks very much, folks. Uh, so last year I talked about extracting zero point energy at the APE conference and also at a, the last SSE conference. What I want to do today is quickly go over those results and then extend the discussion to talk about really the question of what's, what are the underlying principles here? What's happening? Do we violate the second law? And spoiler alert, it's ambiguous. Okay, so let's take a look at what uh, the contents are gonna be. So I'll be talking about zero point energy in general and the problems in harvesting it. Then we'll talk about our device and uh, how we might be able to actually harvest it and what results we're getting. Then I'll talk about the whole issue of virtual particles because virtual particles for the quantum vacuum are, are, are a fundamental and somewhat puzzling issue. Uh, we'll get into the second law of thermodynamics and also the first one too and whether we're violating it. And then finally, I'll have some questions to ask you uh, about this whole phenomena, these phenomena. So let's start off and just talk in general about zero point energy. So we know that the background, that the uh, general background contains electromagnetic fields. Uh, in 1900, Planck came up with the description of uh, the spectrum. And this is the well-known Planck formula, the first theory, which shows that the uh, electric field, that the electromagnetic field distribution at a given temperature is a function of that temperature. Then in 1911, he extended his theory to the second theory in which he talked about the need for an additional term, which was a temperature independent term. Uh, this became known as the zero point energy term because it exists even in the absence of any temperature. Uh, later, we'll see that it comes again, this term. So if we take a look at the spectrum, this is a plot of the energy density of the electromagnetic spectrum as a function of photon energy. Down here, we've got infrared photons, visible light photons, and then ultraviolet light. And we can see the black body spectrum, the well-known Planck distribution, and it peters out by the time we get to the visible light. And that's why at room temperature, we don't see all the radiation around us. It's in the infrared. But there is this radiation that extends up as frequency cubed uh, that uh, exists from this last term, from the zero point energy. And that's the quantum vacuum energy that we're talking about. 
And so a question is, can we use it? Well, the first question is, how much energy is there? This shows the energy. I've done a little calculation to see what is the power that you can get from it. And what in particular, what is the current? So if we take a look at all of the uh, vacuum energy, the zero point energy from long wavelengths going out to uh, about down to about, sorry, up to about four electron volts, which corresponds to about 0.3 microns. Uh, the current that we can get from the, that photon flux, if we could capture it as photons, is huge. It's 1.7 giga amps per square meter. So the, there's, there's a lot there. It's, it's worth looking at if we can get it. Uh, this zero point energy uh, was uh, originally proposed by Planck, but it's really been come to, uh, people have come to understand it in terms of the uncertainty principle. There are several ways, as you know, for expressing the uncertainty principle. One is that the uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty in time uh, is, ha has certain limits. You, you can't know both absolutely precisely. And so the consequence of this is that there must be fluctuations and the shorter the time that we look at for those fluctuations, the larger the energy can be. So if we want substantial energies, they're at very short times. Okay, so what are the problems in trying to harvest this energy? And there are a number of different discussions about it. Uh, I'll talk about really two basic uh, problems in trying to get the energy. One is that it's the universal ground state. And since it's the universal ground state, that means that we can't induce a flow by having a change in its density because it's the same everywhere. The second is that these fluctuations are extremely short-lived. So let's take a look at these in turn. Can we modify the ground state? And most of you know that yes, in fact, we can. It would be a little bit like uh, having an ocean, uh, a, a sea level, and we could then all of a sudden dig out, like Moses, a little region of the sea that was at a lower level. Uh, so if we could do that with the vacuum energy and dig out a region which is at a lower level, then we could induce a flow, and we can do that with the Casimir cavity. Most of you know this was developed by Casimir in 1948, and then finally um, proven to work uh, at the end of the 20th century. The basic idea is that we've got two closely spaced mirrors. In between these mirrors, we have uh, the boundary conditions at the mirror saying that the electric field goes to zero. And so we have a restricted number of modes. It's an integer number of half wavelengths that can exist within this region, whereas outside, we have the full uh, spectrum. Therefore, there's more radiant energy outside than inside. There's a net force, and these two plates should collapse. And in fact, they do. Uh, what I'd like to take from this for today's discussion is that this is sort of a, uh, it, it blocks all the low frequency, uh, long wavelength modes in the zero point energy spectrum. All right, so we talked about modifying the ground state. What about these short-lived fluctuations? Uh, there is a quantum inequality developed by Larry Ford a number of years ago, and he says that an energy delta E may be borrowed from the quantum vacuum for a time delta T. And so it's an uncertainty-like relation. Uh, I'm here putting it into the uncertainty uh, uh, formalism, although this, we, it, it may, the number here may not actually be uh, h bar over 2, Planck's constant uh, over 4 pi, uh, but instead maybe a different number. But it's something like that. And so the basic idea is that you can have radiation uh, that can have a substantial amount of energy, delta E, if you look at it for just a short enough time. So these things bop in and out of, of existence, these, these photons and uh, pairs uh, of, of virtual particles bop in and out of existence. So how much energy and how much time? 
if you say we want two EV light, two electron volt light, which is red, uh, then that says that our uh, time uncertainty or perhaps the time that it can uh, be borrowed for is uh, less than a femtosecond, about a tenth of a femtosecond. So extremely short. It's, it's, they're just very, very ephemeral. All right, so this is borrowing energy from the vacuum. What would happen if we were sneaky and we borrowed the energy and captured it quickly? Uh, what would happen then? Can you do that? Uh, the uh, traditional physics has not addressed that. All right, so now we've talked about zero point energy. Let's now talk about our devices and then get into the results. Uh, the basic device consists of a metal insulator metal structure. So this is a thin metal, it's semi-transparent. It is a very thin insulator, which allows electrons to tunnel or uh, hop over uh, this barrier. And then the base metal is a little bit thicker. So if we imagine this thing just sitting in equilibrium and steady state, we've got uh, zero point energy modes in the base metal. These are dominantly for, for visible light and uh, energies. These are dominantly uh, in the form of plasmons. And so these plasmons will have a distribution. Uh, there'll be fluctuations that can create a sufficiently hot electron to go across the barrier to the top metal. Similarly, in the top metal, there are going to be these plasmons powered by zero point energy that will create electrons that can go in the opposite direction. Um, but this top metal is a little bit thinner, so there are fewer of those electrons. On the other hand, there also are the external vacuum energy modes. And so these external vacuum energy modes can energize an electron by the photoelectric effect. That electron, that hot electron, might be able to traverse this thin metal, go through, across the insulator, and get to the bottom metal. And so in this way, if we're sitting in equilibrium, these two arrows are balanced. There's no net flow. I haven't gone into the details of virtual particles or anything yet. Uh, there's, there's more subtlety here. OK, now let's put a Casimir cavity on top. Uh, we just found out that a Casimir cavity blocks the low frequency modes. And so that means that we're now going to have fewer uh, uh, electromagnetic modes from the zero point field impinging on the top surface, and that diminishes the size of this arrow. So we've now, notionally at least, uh, broken this balance. And so the detailed balance between down and up has changed. We now have a net electron flow from the bottom to the top. I don't claim this is a, a, a rigorous model in any sense. It's simply a notional idea of what's happening. So this is the basic structure of our device. Uh, the actual implementation is shown here. We start with a silicon, uh, with a glass silicon dioxide coated glass uh, silicon substrate. Put a base metal of nickel on it, then uh, a, a very thin double insulator of nickel oxide and aluminum oxide, and then a thin layer of palladium on top uh, to form the cavity on top the the uh, um, Casimir cavity. It would be nice if we could do, use vacuum deposition, but vacuum deposition doesn't mean depositing a vacuum, unfortunately. So it means <laughs> we, we uh, have to put some sort of a thin transparent medium here. And we're using either an organic or uh, a glass or uh, as, as our um, transparent medium, and then we put the mirror on top. The measurement circuit goes between these two uh, metal electrodes in the MIM device. This is a scanning electron micrograph of one of our devices. As you can see, they're quite small. The dimensions are about a tenth of a micron by two tenths of a micron. And uh, so we've built these devices. I won't go through the history of it. I've talked about that in, in, our, in our previous talk. Instead, I'll just jump to a result. So we did find 
a significant change in the current voltage curve. So this is current as a function of voltage. For a device with a fat Casimir cavity, we have the red line, and that's an 1100 nanometer cavity. When we make a, a narrow Casimir cavity, that's the blue line, the uh, resistance decreases substantially. That is, we get more current per unit voltage. And so we see what I'm calling a Casimir doping effect, uh, that uh, the more modes that we can exclude, that is in the thin cavity, the more uh, we reduce the resistance of the device. And we published this result in a physical review research article at the beginning of last year. And more recently, um, Larry Ford has uh, applied uh, some of his theory to looking at this and says, yes, it does look plausible that the Casimir cavity does in fact induce uh, um, some injection into the, into the metal insulator metal device, which would then uh, give us the reduction in resistance. But this is a fairly large voltage scale for these tiny devices. We're plus or minus 0.3 volts. What happens if we look right in here in this region for the very low voltage and very low current? Well, if we do that, we find the strange and intriguing result that the curve does not pass through the origin. If it doesn't pass through the origin, that means it's either using power or producing power. In our case, it's producing power. Uh, solar cells normally operate in the first quadrant. Our devices operate in the third quadrant, which is also a power production quadrant. So we actually are producing power in these devices. And the power is substantial. For some of our better devices, we get uh, about 70 watts per square meter. Now I have to add the caveat that this is, these are very small devices, so we've not yet made large area devices. Well, if this is really due to zero point energy, that would mean that as we widen the Casimir cavity and exclude fewer modes, we ought to be getting a lower current. And that's exactly what we see. So this is the short circuit current as a function of the cavity thickness. And the thicker the cavity is, either for the organic PMMA or for the glass SiO2, we do get a fall off in the current. There are a number of other uh, uh, measurements that we made on these devices, which I'm not going to show right now uh, for lack of time, and, and we have discussed them previously, but I will very briefly address the issue of the reliability of the results. Um, because this, this, this is, if it is correct, uh, uh, quite important. Uh, we verified these results in over 30 batches of devices and measured thousands and thousands of devices. There is scatter in the results, but we consistently see these trends. So could this be due to some sort of a measurement artifact? Uh, we spent a long time looking for measurement artifacts, and I'm going to very quickly go through nine tests we made for measurement artifacts. One question is whether uh, this degrades over time. Is it some sort of chemical effect? And the answer is no. The current is continuous over time. This shows four hours. We've actually upped this to 24 hours. Uh, if this really is due to uh, this sort of photoelectric effect that I'm talking about, it ought to scale with area. And in fact, it does. We've made devices between these submicron devices up to devices that are 100 microns on the side, and it scales with area. Well, does it scale with number of devices? So we've made uh, two types of small arrays. These are four by four arrays. And we find in these arrays that when we have a four by four, we do get four times the current and four times the voltage. Uh, might it just be due to something in our processing because we're cooking the devices as we build them? So uh, we made measurements first with the basic metal insulator metal device. There was no current. We heated it to the temperatures that we would use for processing, no current. We added the dielectric, the, the transparent layer that we'd have and uh, for, the, for making the Casimir current, 
cavity, again, no current. Only when we put the mirror on did we all of a sudden see a current. OK, well, might it be due to some sort of a leakage effect? You've got this thick uh, Casimir cavity on top of a thinner metal insulator metal. Might there be some charge building up there that gets through? So we measured the relative uh, resistance of the Casimir cavity and the uh, metal insulator metal device. The Casimir cavity is at least a million times more resistive. It's very unlikely that any charge that's uh, built up there would get through and give a significant current. Might it be due to electromagnetic pickup from the ambient surroundings? We did our measurements in a mu metal box and an aluminum metal box, and in that way checked for low, low frequency and high frequency electromagnetic pickup and found neither. Might it be due to some sort of a thermoelectric effect? There, there could be two. One is thermoelectric effects within the device itself due to very, very slight temperature differences or thermoelectric effects between the device and the measurement apparatus. So we did some thorough testing for both of those, found nothing, uh, no, no effect. And then just recently, we, we carried out another type of test. And this was actually recommended to us by uh, Jeremy Monday. Monday. And that is, uh, maybe there's some sort of a field effect. Maybe there's a voltage that builds up on the mirror, and that voltage somehow induces current in the, in the uh, metal insulator metal device. And so we did a measurement where we varied the voltage on the mirror up to 10 volts to see if it changed the current through the MIM. The answer is no. All right, so that's for the for the those kind of uh, sanity checks. What about some sort of external source? For example, might it be due to cosmic rays? Well, the highest flux of cosmic rays uh, uh, come from the sun, and there are about 10,000 particles per square meter per second. And given the size of our device, that would mean that one cosmic ray would hit our device every 160 years. We seem to see a current that occurs more often than that. So I don't think it's cosmic rays. Well, what about neutrinos? The neutrino flux is greater. However, the absorption cross-section for neutrinos is extremely small. It's very unlikely that we could capture them because we can't even get them to be captured going all the way through the Earth, never mind in our very thin submicron device. So it's not due to neutrinos or cosmic rays. OK. So that's the results. Now I want to get on to some of the uh, new discussion and uh, mulling over uh, that we're uh, that's related to the, the topics of this conference. Um, and so first, I will discuss the issue of vertical particles and fast capture. So one way to think about this is we, we know about the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect says that light incoming to a metal surface uh, energizes the electrons, and those electrons can be emitted. And this was discovered by Hertz in 1887. In 1905, Einstein uh, codified it as the photoelectric effect, uh, mixing it with Planck's idea of a um, packet, if you like, of, of uh, electromagnetic radiation, which we now call a photon. And so if we have this photoelectric effect, it's been measured by you know, shining light on a piece of metal. But if we really have these zero point energy fluctuations all over the place in the vacuum, doesn't that mean that we ought to just be having this huge stream of electrons coming off metal surfaces? But we don't. Why? Well, one way to answer the question is that uh, the incoming radiation from the vacuum are, are virtu is virtual. These are virtual photons. And the virtual photons aren't going to give us real electron ejection. So let's get into this virtual photon bit and talk about it a little bit. So virtual particles are transient quantum fluctuations. Their existence is limited by the uncertainty principle. Uh, they're usually interaction particles. They mediate uh, interactions between other particles, and you don't see a naked virtual particle. Uh, you just see the results of it. 
Uh, and it's well accepted that vacuum fluctuations produce virtual photons and pairs. Uh, can you take these virtual photons and make them into real photons? The answer is yes, and it's been demonstrated using the dynamical Casimir effect. So the dynamical Casimir effect involves taking this Casimir cavity and very rapidly moving those plates. You've got to do it at relativistic velocities. Uh, and the way that it's actually done in practice is by changing the dielectric of the material. So you're effectively uh, moving them back and forth. And this was demonstrated. And you actually can see the, the existence of real uh, photons produced from these virtual photons. OK, well, if you can do that, might it be possible to use fast capture to do the same thing. So use fast capture to capture these photons, these virtual particles or photons or whatever we produce from them and make it real then. And that's really the question that I'm asking. Can fast capture convert virtual quantum vacuum photons into real photons? And we can get a key to understanding this by looking at evanescent modes because evanescent waves which are well known in optics, are in fact virtual photons. It's the same thing. So let's take a look at evanescent waves and see if we can get some understanding from that. Uh, we know about total internal reflection. If we have a prism and we've got light coming into it and it encounters an interface at a sharp enough angle, then we can get all of the light to be reflected None of it is transmitted if we're past this, article, this, this, this critical angle. Um, and that's true for all of the power, but there is a strange phenomenon in that we have an evanescent wave. We get some leakage of the electromagnetic energy into, uh, to the outside, just outside the prism. There's no power that flows, but it is there. If we take another, prism and we put it uh, a few microns away or a few wavelengths, let me say, away from the, from the first prism, no change. We still get uh, total internal reflection. However, we can frustrate that total internal reflection. And the way we can frustrate the total internal in reflection is by putting these two prisms close enough together. If we get within a fraction of a wavelength, then this uh, uh, evanescent wave becomes a propagating wave. And we can get the light to go all the way through, and we can get energy transmitting. So by allowing this close spacing of these evanescent wave, uh, it, with the evanescent wave, we've turned virtual into real. We can do the same thing with uh, um, electrons. So if we have an incident wave of electrons hitting a barrier, in the barrier, it'll tunnel through, and that's an evanescent state. The transmitted wave will then be some fraction of the incident wave. And in this way, we can capture some of the incident wave uh, in transmission in the other side. And in, so in this way, we're actually creating a, a propagating charge by capturing capturing these virtual particles, if you like, or these evanescent particles. And my conjecture is that we're doing something similar in our devices. OK, so we've talked about virtual particles and capture. Now let's expand a little bit to the topic of this uh, our conference and talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And once we're at it, talk about the first law and whether capturing zero point energy would, in fact, uh, violate something here. Um, the sensible point of view is that uh, forays into free energy inventions and perpetual motion machines using zero point energy are considered by the broader scientific community to be pseudoscience. This was stated in a US Army intelligence report in 2007, so it must be true. And uh, so that's the general view. Let's see. Uh, what we think about it. 
If we want to talk about the second law of thermodynamics, the first question we've got to ask, of course, is which second law of thermodynamics? And uh, we can go through Carnot's principle, Clausius, Kelvin, and so on. They all involve temperature and colder, warmer, uh, things like that. But if we're talking about zero point energy, we believe that zero point energy can exist in the absence of temperature. It can exist when you go all the way down to very low temperatures. And uh, therefore, let's use a statement of the second law that does not involve temperature, and that's Planck's statement. So Planck's statement is that every process occurring in nature proceeds in a way in which the sum of the entropies of all bodies taking part in the process is increased. In other words, we don't have any sort of decrease in entropy in any closed system. And so let's take that as our, as our description of the second law that's applicable. So is there entropy associated with zero point energy modes in a Casimir cavity? Uh, I took this from a publication that looked at a Casimir cavity formed by two metal spheres. Now it can be planes or spheres. I'm using this one simply because it was a nice plot. And this shows how the entropy varies as a function of spacing between these two metal spheres. And you can see that yes, in fact, there is a variation of the entropy in a Casimir cavity as you change the spacing. So what does that mean? Well, if we wanted to change the spacing in a Casimir cavity and get energy out, yeah, we may be having some trouble with the second law. So uh, a lot of the uh, earlier concepts for harvesting zero point energy involved allowing the two cavity plates to move together, extracting energy from that. There's a, a famous for paper by Forward on this. And that would produce, in fact, a reduction in entropy. There's also an, another prop problem, which I won't get into here, and that is that the Casimir force is a conservative force, so you can't get out more than you put in. Um, so mechanical extraction is an issue. However, our device does not modify the Casimir cavity spacing. We have the same device before we extracting current as we do after we're extracting current. The Casimir cavity is a stationary vehicle for making the device work. So therefore, what we really want to look at is the entropy of the quantum vacuum itself rather than the, the entropy inside a Casimir cavity. So what is the entropy uh, of the quantum vacuum? Well, the, the standard answer from quantum mechanics is it's, the, 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 uh, it's a well-defined state. It's, it's the, um, the uh, base state for everything. And therefore, its entropy is 0. And if its entropy is 0, that means that if we want to convert that energy into work, we're free to do so, because we don't have to exclude, we don't have to throw out any entropy along the way in order to make it work. So at least on a fundamental level, there's no problem in uh, harvesting uh, the zero point energy from a vacuum. But there's a, a corollary to the uh, second law of thermodynamics, which really has to do with perpetual motion. So a perpetual motion machine would do work without an external energy source. And in doing that, it either has to violate the first or the second law of thermodynamics or both of them. And so let's take a look at what we're doing a little bit more closely and ask whether we're building some sort of a perpetual motion machine that violates a fundamental law. So in order to do that, we need to say what we're talking about when we talk about the quantum vacuum and zero point energy. There are multiple models of it. And I'm going to uh, describe three here very briefly. One is the standard in qu uh, quantum interpretation uh, uh, from uh, Bohr and so on. Uh, and then there's also stochastic electrodynamics, which, which is, I love. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating 
uh, classical approach, and then something that I'm calling a thermal model. So let's start with the stochastic, with the standard quantum interpretation. So the standard uh, model, the Copenhagen uh, interpretation, is that uh, the zero point energy is a fixture. It's just a fixture of nature. It's there. You can't deplete it. You can't add to it. It's just there. So if you have a little box and you could take all the energy out of the zero point energy out of that little box, you'd still have the same amount of energy in that little box. So if we accept that, that would mean that removing energy would violate conservation of energy, would violate the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, let's take a look at stochastic electrodynamics. So stochastic electrodynamics says that the world is really classical with the addition of background electromagnetic fields that make up a zero point energy radiation. So for example, if we take a look at an atom, uh, according to stochastic electrodynamic model, the atom has an uh, orbiting electron. That electron is, in fact, accelerating, and it's radiating Larmor radiation all around. And so it would wind down and fall into the, into the nucleus, except that there's also incoming radiation from the vacuum. And that dynamic equilibrium between the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation support electronic orbitals. So there's a balance of emission and absorption. So if we take, and there, there's much, much more about stochastic electrodynamics, which we're not going to talk about now. So if we take this interpretation of, uh, of, of our quantum appearing world, then what does that say about uh, the first and second laws? So it says that any way of extracting energy locally from the zero point fields would have to be fed by the surrounding electromagnetic fields. And so in that way, we actually would be conserving energy because we're pulling it from somewhere, but we're putting it in as well. And so the first law is observed. And as we said earlier, uh, the, the zero entropy interpretation of the quantum vacuum says the second law is also being observed. Finally, let's take a look at the thermal model. So again, this is what I'm calling the thermal model. Uh, so if we take a look at the formula once again for the uh, uh, energy density of zero point energy radiation, the energy density includes a uh, temperature dependent term and a temperature independent term, this being the zero point energy. Interestingly, we can express that same thing mathematically as a, a hyperbolic cotangent. And so we're actually mixing, if you like, the zero point energy in the thermal terms here. This is just a, 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 an arithmetic. There's nothing uh, fundamental here, but it sure makes me think that these two things, the thermal energy and the zero point energy are fundamentally tied at the hip. Are they somehow combined? For example, even though our quantum mechanical viewpoint right now certainly doesn't say this, is it possible that if we were able to extract zero point energy, we'd have to feed it uh, with thermal energy? And so the, the, the location where we extracted it from would cool. So in that way, if zero point energy and thermal energy come from the same source, extracting zero point energy would produce cooling. We would obey the first law because we're, we're, we're getting real energy from somewhere, but we would be violating the second law because cooling uh, an ambient situation in equilibrium is a, a clear violation. So which of these three models do we take or is there another model entirely? Uh, that's, that's up to you. Okay, so let's take a look at the summary of our results so far. We've made Casimir cavities adjoining ultra-fast charge transport, transport devices. Uh, they produce power. Um, we've uh, shown that they, uh, the form for this power varies as we would expect it to if the source of the power were zero-point energy. And I, I wasn't able to show you all of that. Our papers uh, describe it in more detail. Uh, we've looked carefully for artifacts, and at least so far, we've not been able to find any sort of artifacts, and our measurement apparatus is, is the most sensitive available. We're also starting to get some measurements 
from outside labs that are corroborating what we're seeing, uh, but we, we haven't yet uh, done that to uh, a sufficient accuracy for publication. We've written two papers on this so far. So what are the consequences of all of this? If the measured 70 watts per square meter power that we uh, found in our small devices, if that could be reproduced over large areas, and if we could take these and stack these devices, I mean, there's no reason we can't go into the third dimension, we could quite easily get lithium ion battery power densities. We could make a very practical uh, power source. What's the consequence? It would be revolutionary. Okay, so let's go quickly to the last part, which is the unanswered questions. Uh, one question is, why do we not see a large photoelectric effect from zero point energy at all metal surfaces? And I raised this. And the, the, the standard answer is that the uh, uh, photons, or it, it, we shouldn't even call them that, the electromagnetic modes uh, from the uh, uh, vacuum are virtual. Uh, can we uh, use fast capture to convert those uh, particles, those virtual particles to real particles? I don't know. If the zero point energy hot electron excitation between both elect electrodes uh, exists, why isn't there a huge conductivity even in the absence of a Casimir cavity? Uh, well, the model of Larry Ford uh, says that in fact, we do require a cavity uh, to, for the electron injection. And, and he, he discussed that briefly earlier in this uh, conference. However, uh, uh, Larry is very clear to say that he does not have an asymmetry. In other words, current goes in both directions. So he, it, it's not an explanation for the currents that we're seeing. Um, so if there is uh, symmetric excitation, why don't we see currents in both directions? Why do we see an asymmetry? And I raise the conjecture, is that due to fast capture? Or are we uh, really looking at this whole thing the wrong way altogether? And is there another model for operation that fits our results a lot better? It's really early in the game and it's too soon to tell. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. That was a wonderful talk. So I'm sure we'll have some questions here when we get to the participants. Um, okay, we'll start with uh, Kent Peacock. Thanks very much. And uh, fascinating talk. I don't quite understand every detail of it, but um, it, it did strike me that that uh, there's a, there may be an interesting parallel between your work and uh, Schrodinger's observations in, in 1943. So Schrodinger published a famous book called What is Life, uh, in, in which he asked himself, how can we account for the thermodynamics of a living organism? Because a living organism, as long as you're still alive, it maintains a constant, roughly constant level of entropy. And um, how, is it, how is this possible without violating thermodynamics somehow? And he, he realized, of course, that it, it's because we metabolize and in the process we're pumping entropy out through infrared radiation from our bodies from when we exhale carbon dioxide and so forth we're pump so, so so we're actually creating more entropy than we're i guess you could say preventing within our bodies and and so nothing gets violated but you can create local areas where the entropy is either constant or or lowered but there's always an energy cost so you have to so I sort of com compare this to like, imagine there's a giant pile of basketballs on the gym floor and it's gonna fall down very easily. And you've got to always keep on putting basketballs back onto it to hold it up again. So anyway, I just throw that out. Is there a parallel between what Schroeder was talking about there and, and what you're talking about? So from a conventional thermodynamics point of view, I'd say no because uh, we know that we can re reduce entropy by adding energy to the system. 
and we, as as in what is life that, from from Schrodinger. Um, in this case, we're actually extracting energy, uh, and we don't seem to be paying any sort of entropic cost for that. So, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, the, I, I, I honestly and totally don't know, but I, I'm not sure that we need to uh, take that approach. Okay. I'm willing to bet the energy is coming from somewhere. But, well, I believe it is. Which is certainly not to invalid, question your results, but, but we might be, be surprised where the energy is coming from, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you, you're probably right. Well, okay. Um, Paul Menker. Yeah, I just had a couple um, more, maybe more comments and questions, but it, it is interesting that, you know, in some sense, all these quantities are formally infinite, the energy of the vacuum. So if, if you're using kind of underhanded math, you could have, you know, subtract a finite amount of energy from an infinite vacuum and not kind of change that. But I, I think what this might be touching on Planck level quantum gravity questions, because, you know, the, the, the vacuum energy breaks down at the Planck scale. Um, otherwise, everything would turn to a black hole. And like all of these ideas, like quantum, quantum field theory formally breaks down. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting that this could be an avenue into these, you know, very pressing questions one day. Um, but maybe for more of a question, do you see any like, true challenges to, to scaling up the size aside from like the normal logistic challenges or is there any like theoretical or engineering reason to think that this is like only valid at small scales uh no i think it can be scaled the big problem that we're having and the reason that we're slow at doing that is that we're using metal insulator metal devices uh which are uh essentially all interface and uh i think uh um, George in the previous talk, and in, in previous talk, talked about how really the, the 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 devil lives in the interfaces, and it's it's a it's a challenging technology. So at this point, it's a technological issue. Sure, because you know there's nothing in principle wrong with a small effect. I mean, you know, g minus two is in the tenth decimal place of the fine structure constant, but there is on the rhetorical side something a little more convincing, I think, to a general audience about just a larger effect. And, you know, there's just there's the unknown unknowns, you know, and, and the larger the effect, the harder it is to explain. It's just something we're not thinking of, you know? Yes, uh, yeah. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Justin Coven. Hi, I'm going to elaborate a little bit um, on what I mentioned earlier um, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, I'm coming from the computational sciences, uh, artificial intelligence, software engineering. And for somebody who has to take these different scientific models, theoretic models actually has to put them into, you know, running systems. And, you know, we look at these different systems and, and often you get the same thing done with many different models. So we have different evaluation criteria. Of what are the different properties of those models? And when, when you take that view and you start looking at, let's say, laws of physics, it, you go to this, the, the point that was talked about by Daniel before that these are axioms. But you also start looking at, well, how is that axiom actually used? And if you're looking at, let's say, the conservation of energy, which underlies the second law, uh, second property of thermodynamics, I don't want to call it a law because when you're talking law, you're talking government, you're not talking science. Science is, you, know, you have models and, pro and you have properties of models. And you know, so the conservation of energy is it, an important property of any computational model. And you're going to want to maintain that. You're going to want to have conservation uh, either, and that conservation go, can go across systems. So uh, I'll go back to my you know, uh, mechanics physics book uh, from the junior level and how they talked about different levels. They talked about the cosmological level, the macro micro level, then the atomic level, and then the subparticle level. And uh, they said, well, we've got the same conservation laws, same momentum laws at the cosmological and macro micro. But when you start going to the atomic level, well, we change them all up because things are not operating the same way. Uh, and then when you go to the subparticle, everything, you know, forget about it. Uh, now, so you want to have a computational system that crosses those boundaries and you have the same conservation models across all of them. 
Um, and you, you, you want to be able to say, okay, what's happening at the sub subparticle level? What are the mechanisms that are going there? And you okay. want that. Justin, can you please get to the point? Sure. Okay. Um, so, so the point is when everybody's talking about the second law of thermodynamics, they're talking about a property. They're talking about a comp computational property that's very valuable. And no matter what computational model you want to have, you're going to want to have that property, whether you're saying energy is coming from the zero point so that there's some energetic interactions happening at the zero point. There's some mechanisms happening at the zero point. And, and that's one of the research groups I'm in, subquantum kinetics, and we're studying what are the mechanisms at the zero, zero point with Paul Lavendelitz's group. Um, and so when, when you're actually going from there, um, you, you, you can have energy and the mechanisms that are happening at that level, you know, transferring to the atomic level, which then transfer to the macro micro world that we're looking at the, these things happening and also the cosmological level. Um, okay, so Garrett, Garrett, you can want you, to can have you, that energy, you want to have Justin, that conservation across those different levels, and you want to have a computational model that has that. Okay. okay. Garrett? Uh, time will tell. We were, we're early in, in understanding this, and okay. uh, I, I don't have a, an intelligent answer to that. Okay, uh, I'd like to call on Larry Ford. Okay, well, for, for, first, uh, a couple of comments. This is, a for, first, a very fascinating and, and thought-provoking talk. Uh, thank you for that. But uh, I have to say that I, I although, I, as I explained uh, a couple of days ago, I can understand the symmetric results, that is, why, why the current, uh, why there can be a current that varies inversely as the uh, uh, as the size of the Casimir cavity with an applied voltage. I'm completely puzzled about the uh, uh, the existence of the current at zero applied voltage and have no no idea where, where that could be coming from. So in, in terms of that latter result, my question is, are there any other labs that are uh, that you know of are attempting to independently uh, confirm your results? Uh, yes, so we've had two confirmations so far. Neither of them are uh, have been replicated enough to be publishable. And uh, so I'm, I'm waiting, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that will happen within a fairly short time. And uh, I agree completely that, uh, you know, this, this is a, a radical enough result that it, one really wants confirmation. We want confirmation ourselves. And so- Yeah, we're uh, doing it as well at Hathaway Research. Thank you. I didn't want to mention you, George, in case you didn't want to say that, but That's yes. Okay. okay. James Lee, then uh, Jacob. Um, did, did Larry have a second part to his... Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a second part? Oh, that, I apologize. That, no, I, I finished. Thank you. Oh, all right. Thank you. James Lee. Okay. Uh, Garrett, very fascinating talk. Um, our question is, in your system, um, is there any asymmetric um, uh, uh, structure or function there? was not clear to me. <laughs> and also the, another question was, you said borrow energy. Now, if, if the energy does not exist in borrow, that thing is a violation of the first law. You know, we never see anything in my system. First law is well, well conserved. You know, there's nothing we can see if why the first law, okay? Uh, so why the first law, I was think they got as impossible <laughs> unless we don't totally understand, okay? So my question to focus on is to your structure in your system, is there any symmetric function? Because if you have a symmetric function, then the, then the second law may or may not apply, okay, right? So that's my question. Okay, so let me quickly show you. Um, yes, we do have an asymmetry, and that is, I believe, the, the, the con what's producing this here. So the asymmetry is that we have this metal insulator, metal device here, and the, on one side of it, there's a Casimir cavity. On the other side, there is not. And uh, that, I believe, is what is inducing the, the, the flow of energy. I don't think we're violating the first law, but as I described in, in uh, the various models, really it depends on what model you choose. I should mention one thing in passing. I, I developed this uh, about five or six years ago, uh, this concept. It, it wasn't something where we accidentally discovered in, uh, uh, something in the lab and tried to figure out. It was actually the other way around. We first had the concept and then we went around, we went about building the device to match the concept and lo and behold, it exactly matched what I was hoping it would. Thank you. Okay, so now I see, yeah, there could, looks like there's some symmetric, uh, uh, yeah. could be possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Other questions? Okay. Um, okay. Jack it. Garrett, it, was, it was fascinating uh, your your uh, your speech about this. I had a feeling that this that's that's uh, uh, so fascinating because it was it was crowned with uh, with success. Yes. So uh, it was exactly my, the same idea. Why don't you put the second cavity, Casimir cavity underneath and to, uh, to mm -hmm. look what happens? Yes, uh, that's right. Thank uh, you. Would you like to come to my lab and work on that? <laughs> yeah, <I'd like> <laughs> <laughs> These devices are very challenging. Uh, unfortunately, when you've got these thin layers, uh, everything depends on everything else. And if we put down, for instance, the polymer below and then put a metal insulator metal on top, it changes everything. All the ins interfaces are changed and we would need, you know, months to, to refine our process to get it to work again. So I agree, it would be very interesting. We just haven't done it yet. Okay. All right, any final questions? Okay, Garrett, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And I think people will be talking about this for a long time. At this point, I think we'll take a, maybe a three or four minute break to set up for the, um, uh, for the panel discussion. So we'll, we'll be back online in just a few minutes.